Hello, everyone. Welcome to the FME Server Authoring Course. I'm your host for the next 15 minutes. My name's Ryan. Once I've gone through an introduction of the web application we're using here, uh, Strigo, for, present, for presenting this course, I'll be handing the presentation over to Laura. Um, yeah, so my name is Laura, so I'm going to be um, one of your presenters for the FME Server Authoring course over the next five days. Uh, Holly Coxon will also be presenting, so we'll be kind of trading off chapters as we go. So she's out here right now as a TA, so you can always chat with her while I'm speaking here. Um, we also have a few others on uh, as TAs today, just here to help answer questions. Uh, so we have Sienna as well, and Nathan and Sinai are out there too and can help you with anything. We've got lots of people out there just to, to see how this course goes. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions at all, just chat them in through the uh, that public channel or directly to any of the TAs and we can help you out. So let's get going. So I'll just start with a brief outline of what we're going to be covering over the next five days. So we'll have five chapters in the online training manual. So the first chapter that we're covering today will simply be an introduction to FME Server. So we'll just look at the basics of what FME Server is and how to work with it. Uh, tomorrow, Holly is going to be taking over to talk about data handling and FME Server. So um, yeah, FME is all about being able to take your data and do what you need to with it. So it's very important to kind of dive in into how to set up FME Server to properly work with the data sets that you want to be converting and interacting with. Next, we'll look at some self-serve basics. So we'll get into some details of exactly what that means, but we'll be talking about how um, to author your workspaces so that your end users can interact with them with FME Server more easily and how to deal with the outputs for those and how to make those available. Next, we'll get into handling real-time data with FME Server, and this will include a deep dive into automations. So being able to set up your workspaces to run automatically in response to events. And then finally, we're going to deal with some real-time message handling. So that's dealing with kind of higher capacity message streaming going through FME Server. So with that, so for the course today, I'm not going to be using slides for much else. So I'm going to be switching over to my lab here, and I'm going to be presenting off of the training manual for now. So I'll just switch over to that. There we go. Yeah. So if you want, um, yeah, so you can just follow along here. So just watch my screen with the present or follow presenter here, and I'll just walk you through the first bit of chapter one here. So as mentioned, we've got the course structure, not six, actually five sections. Uh, so I'll just briefly get into the course resources here. So on your training machines, as Ryan had mentioned, you've got FME desktop there. So you probably have that started up if you took the time to get that going. Uh, and we also have FME server 2020.1 installed on these machines. It be useful for the training here. In addition to that, we also have all of the data and resources needed for following these exercises on these training instances. So you'll find those on the C drive in the FME data 2020 folder. And that's the basics there. So if anyone's having any trouble with your machines or connections or anything like that, just let us know through the chat and we can help you out. So I'll get going, it's chapter one here. So first question, what is FME Server? Uh, so FME Server is basically, it's, the, it's a product that takes your kind of, all the power of FME for data translation and, and all that to the enterprise level. So there are three core capabilities that we discuss when we talk about FME Server. So the first one is self-serve. Um, so this basically is the ability to allow your end users to select and download any data they require. So they could come into FME Server, click a few buttons and request data, maybe from a central uh, database or something like that. They can also request that data in the format and restructure they require. So we'll look at some techniques for configuring your workspace to make this easy for your end users and to provide the data in, in, the different, uh, in different ways. 
The other aspect of self-serve is being able to take existing data sets and upload them to FMU server for processing. Uh, so this is useful perhaps in a case where you have people out collecting data or updating data sets and you want to have that data go through a validation process. So you can have your end users take the data set that they've created, upload it to FME server, and run it through a validation process to find out if there are any problems with the data before bringing that into your own internal systems. And again, we'll look at some examples of how to do that uh, later on here. The next capability we'll discuss is real time. Uh, so that's basically the ability for FME server to react to events or sensor data in real time. So whenever there's a change somewhere out in the real world, you can have FME server find that or see that change and carry out updates or run workflows as soon as those changes happen. Uh, this can go two ways. So you can have FME server monitor something external to it and react to that by running workspaces and processing the data that's being created. Or you can have FME server um, send out notifications to other systems when something changes in the server environment as well. And finally, automation. So it's the ability to carry out data processing on a specific schedule and to spontaneously move data through your systems. So uh, this is a little bit like real time, except here you can actually just use um, scheduling and other things to be able to automate what happens. So usually the real time kind of events driven notification system and automations go hand in hand. So we'll see some examples of that in, in chapters over the next few days as well. Uh, just talking about FME server versus FME desktop. Uh, so if you're in this course, um, I'll assume that you have some level of familiarity, at least with the FME desktop environment. So you've kind of built some workspaces using Workbench and you have an idea of what FME can do there. Uh, so server is a product that builds on top of the capabilities of FME desktop. Uh, so these two products always work together. Uh, FME desktop is the environment or the authoring environment. So that's where you create your workspaces that connect to your data sets and do your data manipulation and transformations and write out your output to wherever you need it to go. FME Server can take those workspaces and provide different ways to automate it and provide other layers to be able to run those workflows and that kind of thing. Um, so FME Desktop and FME Server always connect to each other. Um, so you build your workspace at Desktop and you publish that up to FME Server to be able to take advantage of server's capabilities. FME Server itself has no way of editing your workspaces. So desktop's where you create them, server's where you automate and run them. So a little bit of background here. So for the purpose of this course, we'll be talking about different roles uh, who are, are different kinds of people who would use FME Server. So these are just kind of some information about the different roles that we'll be talking about, just to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of language and how we, how we talk about FME server and the people who work with it. So for the context of this course, we'll have three different roles that we'll be discussing. Um, the author role, this is the, the one that's the main focus of the course today. Uh, the author is the person who is familiar with both FME desktop and FME server. So this is the person who would be creating the workspaces in desktop and publishing them to server and then using server to um, automate how those run or configuring them to run in a way that your end users would be able to access easily. So typically an author has, is an experienced FME desktop user with a good understanding of the different readers and writers and transformers available there. It also be someone who's familiar enough with FME server to be able to take advantage of server's capabilities on top of that workspace. So we're going to be authors for this training course today. We'll be looking at building workspaces um, that work very well with FME server and how to take advantage of what FME server has to offer. So the next kind of user we'll be talking about is the user. So this is a person who would be accessing your data using the FME server service. Um, so these users wouldn't necessarily have any experience of FME and may not even know what FME desktop or FME server are. Uh, they just know they have data they need to access, their data they need to upload for processing, and know where to click to make that happen. So for this course, we'll be 
looking at how to design workflows that make the experience for the user uh, much more seamless and easy. Another role we'll be talking about here a little bit is the developer role. Um, so this one is basically FME Server can be used to help power other software applications. So FME Server itself has a pretty powerful REST API. So you may have a developer who wants to create an application that integrates with FME Server that can automatically submit jobs to the server and handle the results. Um, so this is where that developer would come in. So they could work, make use of the REST API to create workflows or create applications that would use FME Server um, uh, kind of to help power it in the back end. Uh, we have a whole course about the FME Server APIs. So if you're interested in kind of the development role and kind of building things on top of FME Server, uh, there is the FME Server REST API training course out there. So you can check that out if you'd like more details about that. The final role that will come up in this training is the role of the FME Server Administrator. Uh, so this would be the person who's responsible for actually installing and maintaining FME Server itself. So this is the person who has like that admin level access on the system, knows how to plan the system architecture, um, what applications need to be installed on server for it to work. Uh, they'd be managing the security, you know, firewalls, all those settings, and kind of diving in deep to how FME Server is configured and set up and shared across your environment. Uh, we also have a, an FME Server course dedicated to the administrator role. So we have the FME Server Administration Training. So if you're interested in kind of diving deep into the architecture and security requirements and all that, uh, that's definitely a good course to, to watch as well. So we won't be getting very deep into the, the architecture side of server for today. Okay, so here, as I say, we're not getting into architecture. Let's get into architecture a little bit. Um, so we're going to look at a few of the components of FME Server that will relate to you as the author. Um, so these are the FME engines themselves, the FME Server core, and the FME Server web services. So for the purpose here, so one thing we'll talk about are the FME Server engines. So this is the piece of FME Server that actually runs any jobs that are being submitted in the server environment. This engine is exactly the same as the engine that runs any workspaces that you create and run inside FME Workbench. So when you click that Run button to run a workspace in Workbench, it'll spin up an FME engine to process that. Uh, that is the same component that's used in FME Server. The difference, though, um, in Workbench is you can only spin up one engine at a time to run a works one workspace at a time. In server, you can have uh, as many engines as you need connected to your FME server um, core, so the, the FME server itself. Uh, having more engines allows for processing more jobs simultaneously. So if you have one engine on your FME server environment and try to submit something like 10 jobs, FME server will see those jobs. It'll run the first one that was submitted and queue up the other nine, waiting for the engine to be free to process the next job. So it'll kind of process them all one by one in order. What's nice is that FME server will take care of, kind of handling the queuing of those jobs and making sure nothing gets lost. But um, yeah, so that's, that's useful there. So you can submit the 10, but they will run of one by one in order. When you have more engines installed or more engines connected to your server, so for example here, if you have say 10 engines and you submit 10 jobs, all 10 jobs will run at the same time, each on one of those different engines. So the more engines you have, the more kind of throughput you can have on your FME server environment. So the server core is kind of the, the brains of the operation. So this is the piece that actually manages all of the content within your FME server environment. So it'll handle all the workspaces that have been published. It'll deal with job management, scheduling, and job queuing. So when you have multiple jobs all running, it'll take care of the logic of deciding which ones to run next and which ones get which engine and all that. Uh, this component also deals with handling um, automations, uh, keeping track of repository contents, so if you have any custom formats or data or anything up on your server. Uh, it handles the licensing and the engines, making sure those don't get lost and everything there. 
So this is a very important component that yeah, basically controls how the server works and keeping track of all the different moving parts. The last thing we'll talk about here are the web services. Um, so these help provide uh, communication between FME server and its clients. So FME server, uh, one example of an FME server client would be just logging into FME server in a web browser and making requests to run jobs. Um, so the different services will help manage kind of what happens when you click certain buttons and when you want to do certain actions. So we'll look at these services in more detail in a, in a future chapter. Uh, but these are just some of the basic ones here, and we'll see what they're all about coming up. Okay, so we're, we're approaching our first exercise here. So um, first thing we'll talk about here is workspaces and FME server. So how do these kind of work together? So we talked about workbenches being the authoring environment for server. Uh, workspaces are the, the things that you create in workbench. And these basically um, tell FME server what to do with the data that's going to be processed. So for server, we consider this a model-driven architecture because its processes or its workflows are expressed as models. And in FME, we call these models workspaces. So this is the, the logic behind what it should do with particular data sets uh, when we want to run those. FME Workbench is a client of FME server, so they're considered a client-server pair and can talk to each other to pass workspaces back and forth. Uh, so because Workbench is a client of server, um, you can use Workbench to transfer your workspaces up to the server. We call this process publishing. So within Workbench, you have the ability to first create your workspace, and then you can publish, republish, or download workspaces to and from FME server. So one bit of terminology we'll talk about here is the concept of a repository. And we'll see this when we look at the publishing workspaces and we, and we start exercise one here as well. Um, when you create a workspace and publish it to FME server, you will store those workspaces in what we call repositories. So repositories essentially act as a folder which will store um, information, um, including the workspace itself and any information about the workspace. Um, so that can include uh, metadata information like the contents of the workspace, so the, the readers and writers that are present, any published parameters or connections to other systems or databases, anything like that. So the repository itself is made up of two pieces. So the first one is just the file system itself, which stores the workspace, the FMW file directly. So we have the file system for that. And then the FME server database, which is just a backend component of FME server that helps store information, um, that's where all the metadata about the workspace is stored. So when you create any new repository, uh, these two items are created as well, and it stores all the information server needs about your workspace. So next, how do you actually transfer these workspaces between Workbench and Server? Uh, that's done through Workbench. Uh, if you look at the file menu there, you'll have a Publish to Server button, Republish, and a Download. Uh, you can also use the icons in the toolbar for the same thing, Publish, Republish, and Download. So when you go to Publish or Connect to FME Server, so when you first open the Publish Wizard, it'll just walk you through the different steps for being able to set up FME Server to receive your workspace. So first thing you'll be doing is creating a web connection, which just contains the credentials for your FME Server that you'd like to connect to. Next, you will select a repository to store your workspace in. You can always choose to create a new repository at that stage before creating or before uploading your workspace. Uh, the next part of the wizard will let you upload any um, connections. So if you have any um, web or database connections that were included in the workspace, you can publish those and store them in FME server as well. And we'll get into this a little bit more when we get into uh, data handling. The final step of the publish to server wizard lets you register with any of the different services for FME server, just to telling it how to, uh, or what to do with the workspace and what to do with the output data. And again, we'll look at that coming up as well. 
uh, about what each of these services does and how to use them in different contexts. Uh, the republish button only becomes active after you've published the workspace once uh, and you're in the same session of Workbench, so you can always republish your workspace with a single click. Uh, I find that useful if you need to make any minor changes to the workspace itself after you've published the first time. So sometimes I'll publish a server, realize I maybe I forgot a data set or a connection or something like that. I can just go back into Workbench, make that change, and republish that quickly. And then finally, downloading a workspace works pretty much the same way. Select your repository, choose your workspace, and decide where you want to save it. You can always download any workspace from FME server if you need to make changes after the fact. Okay, so this brings us to the first exercise of the day. Uh, so for this exercise, we'll be uh, just doing a very simple workflow. So you're going to be creating a very basic workspace that does some data um, data conversion. So here in for this chapter and all the exercises moving forward, you're going to be playing the part of a technical analyst in the GIS department for your local syst uh, for your local city. Uh, and you're going to be building different workflows as they investigate and explore FME server to see uh, what it can do for them. So for this exercise, you're going to be connecting to a couple of different um, data sets and converting them to a new format and then publishing the workspace to FME server so we can start taking advantage of the different ways of making this available to the end users. All right, so we're back here. So I'm going to continue on. So yeah, that was just a fairly straightforward or straightforward exercise here, just building a simple workspace in Workbench just to, to kind of review how that works. So here you're connecting to two different data sets for fire halls and the neighborhoods in the city of Vancouver using the clipper to find um, which fire halls fall inside which neighborhoods and then writing this out using the null writer. So this workspace really does nothing right now but we'll actually be working with this um, I think coming up later on in the uh, training course as well. So for this exercise, uh, the key piece here is once you've created the workspace, we needed to publish this up to FME server. So the first step here was adding a web connection and putting in the FME server credentials. So we're logging in as administrators for this FME server, so we have full access to everything in that environment. The next step was to create a training repository to store all the workspaces we'll be building for this course and uploading your workspace there. And we simply registered with the job submitter service, which is just a simple service that runs a job exactly as it's uh, configured inside the workspace. So this is a good one to start with when you're first testing to make sure your workspaces are running and to use them in uh, FME server itself. So at that stage, you should see in the log window for your FME workbench instance that you'll have this published summary inside. Uh, this is useful just to confirm that everything kind of went as planned when you published your workspace up. So you can double check the username and, and repository that were used for publishing this, what the workspace was called, uh, any data that was uploaded with the workspace. So here we uploaded the source files along with the workspace. And you can actually use this direct link to go straight to run the workspace in the FME server web interface. So that was the basics there. Um, and again, if anyone has any questions or anything like that, uh, feel free to send that out in the public channel or ask any of the TAs that are available today uh, and we can help you out with those. So we'll move on to some, no some new concepts here and we'll start looking at FME server itself and some of the basics of the web interface there. So for accessing the web interface for FME server, there's a few different ways to get at it. Uh, if you're on the machine where FME server is installed, you can find it from the start page. So I'm going to demonstrate a few things here on my lab. Uh, you can just watch for now. We're going to be doing an exercise coming up where you'll get to uh, interact with the web interface yourself. So for anything I'm doing for the next few minutes, uh, just watch and uh, I'll walk through it for now and to demonstrate and you'll get a chance to try it out later. So here at the start menu, you can always access FME server from here if you're on the machine where it's installed. It'll be under the FME server folder. 
and you can go to the FME server web interface. So that's just a shortcut to the server's home URL. If you're on a machine that's not the same one as where FME server is installed, you can access FME server directly through a web browser using a URL, something like this. So it'll be the server name slash FME server. So for here, if I go to another tab in my web browser, I can simply go to localhost because that's where my FME server is installed and that'll pop up the FME server homepage. I'm logging in with the administrator password that we used in our first exercise. And you'll be using that later on as well to access the interface. So this is what the home page for FME server looks like. So from here, you can get a glimpse of what's kind of going on in your server environment and that. Uh, so the first panel here is just links to various pieces of help and documentation. So you can get links to the documentation, the community, uh, server demos, anything like that. The training course, if you need to go back to reference. The next panel shows any recent jobs that have been run on your FME server. Since this is new, you shouldn't have anything yet. Uh, but this is where you can check on the status of any jobs that were run recently. The next thing you'll see here is a list of last published jobs. You may not recognize some of these. These were you know, published when the server was installed. But you should see at the very top the, um, the workspace that you published a few minutes ago during the last exercise. So here I published mine about 12 minutes ago. Down below as well, you can see any workspaces that you've marked as favorites, any recent projects you've worked with. So we'll look at what a project is coming up and any recent automations that you've created. And again, we'll cover what those are uh, later on in the course. A couple other useful things in here. Um, there's always links to the help from the top right-hand corner here. It's the same list as available in this panel. Um, one nice thing here is that this documentation is contextual. So if you're on any of the pages in FME server, so if, for example, if you go to the jobs page and you're not sure what to do, if you click on documentation, it'll actually bring up a page directly related to the page that you're currently on. So that's useful if you're just looking for some help with different settings in the server environment. The other thing here is the user settings. So this will just have any information um, or any settings that are specific to your user account. So here's where you can change your password, update your email, reset any preferences, and enable or disable dark mode, depending on what you prefer for viewing. So there's dark mode. I find dark mode's not great for presenting, so I'll just keep that off for now. Another key piece here is the left-hand side navigation. Uh, so the top section of items are all related to authoring and workspace management. The bottom section here is related to administration of FME server itself. In a typical installation, um, if security uh, is enabled and you are simply an author and not an administrator, you'll normally just see this top section and not the admin section. For this training course, we've given everything, or it's wide open so you can see everything in the server environment. Let me just reference what we're looking at here. So first thing I'll mention here is the engine and licensing page. So that's an administration section, but it's good to know about. So from engines and licensing, you can just check that your server is licensed for one. So here you have a license for 10 engines on these training machines. Uh, you can also check the number of engines that are currently uh, running on your server. So here we have it configured to start up two standard engines. So with this, we can run two jobs at the same time. This is always a good place just to come and check to see if your engines are up and running and how they're working. Down below, we also have the option to create queues. Um, these queues can be used to basically direct jobs to specific engines. So if you want to have, say, one engine dedicated for one particular set of tasks, you can use a queue to do that. So it kind of just handles where jobs get routed and which engines used for which particular jobs. This also lets you set a priority. So you can have certain jobs with a higher priority than others. So they'll always run before any lower priority jobs. Uh, the other thing we'll look at here is the run workspace page. So we'll be using this in the next exercise. And this is where you can simply 
run a workspace, as the name suggests. So you can always select your repository, choose your workspace and service. So we've only registered with Job Submitter, so there's only one available. Down below, you can set any values for any published parameters directly within the workspace. And at the very bottom of this page, so we're not going to be using this much for now, but there's the advanced section. So this has some advanced options. So you can set the job queue if you need to send this to a specific engine, uh, and a few other things like the queued job expiry time. So if this job has to wait for longer than a set amount of time in the job queue before it's processed, you can set this up to basically expire. So if this job waits two hours before it runs, maybe it'll be maybe the data is going to be too old by then and you don't want it to run, or you have a schedule and you don't want it to run a second time with the same data. So it lets you control how long this is allowed to wait before it runs. And then we also have a running job expiry time. So you can tell FME server that if this job runs beyond a certain length, then just cancel it and stop it from running. So this is useful if you know you have some jobs that take you know, maybe a couple seconds to run. And sometimes bad things happen on the network that cause it to get stuck. Then you can use this to configure that. This isn't used very often, but it can be useful in some cases. Then you also have the run until cancelled option. This is good for um, working with data stream. We'll see that coming up. But basically, what this will tell FME server is to keep running this job over and over and over again until someone manually cancels it. So this is useful if you have a job that's set up to run continually to connect to a data stream and process data as soon as it comes through. And we'll talk about how that's useful uh, coming up as well. The other thing that's useful here is other ways to run this workspace. So we'll be building a server app coming up. But you can create an application to let other people run this workspace without having to log in to FME server. And you can also create a webhook URL that lets external so, uh, software run this workspace. So basically it just creates a, a URL that a user can um, or a, an application can send a post request to to run the workspace automatically. So that's a little bit more of an advanced thing, but it's good to know it's there. And finally, the last step of our tour here will be the jobs page. Uh, so this is where you can come and check on any jobs that have been run on your server environment. So here you can see a list of any completed jobs, uh, what their status was, and how long it took to run. You can also see any jobs that are waiting in the queue. So if you have a particularly busy server and jobs are having to wait for an engine before they can be processed, uh, this is where you can find that. And then finally, you can check on any jobs that are currently running. So if you have some jobs that take a little while to run, you can come in here and check on their status. Uh, you can also look at the log file as the job is being run, so you can see kind of where in the process it is. So it's useful to be able to check on that. So that's the basics there. So let's go on to the next exercise here. And so this exercise, you'll be logging into your FME servers and running the job that you just published. So that was a fairly straightforward exercise again. So we're just taking a look at that workspace on FME server and uh, just running that through the web interface. So this one just took you on a little tour of the web interface as well, going through everything, make sure your server's up and running and licensed properly. And then you simply ran the workspace. So when that finished, you should have seen a page similar to this one with a completed summary at the bottom. Oh, I've got a question there. I'll cover that in just a second here. Um, so here you get your job ID. So that just tells you um, kind of the unique identifier for the job that was run. And then it gives you a very small summary of the number of features that were written uh, or that were sent to the writer in the workspace. When you view details, you can see more information about the job. So you can also access this from the jobs page itself. And that just provides a more detailed view of the information for the job that was run. So one question here is how are those results stored? Um, so the information about kind of the status and the started and finished time of the workspace, uh, that information is stored in the backend database for FME server. Um, so that'll have information about the job ID and everything else related to it. Um, the job log file itself is stored on the FME server file system. 
So generally you can simply access that by clicking on it in the jobs page for server, but you can also access that from the resources folder. So I can quickly show that a little bit here. Um, so here I'll just run a job just to show. I'll just take one of the samples ones for now. So that'll submit it and I can view it through the jobs page here. There we go. So one way to get access, you get all the detailed information on this page. You can also download the log file for the job. So this log file would be the same as what you would see inside Workbench in that log window. Um, this information is also stored in the files for FME servers under this files and connections resources, and you can get access to all the logs for the system from here. So those end up inside the engine folder in this jobs folder there. So then you can see a list of all of the, the jobs that have been submitted on FME server. I always find it's easiest just to go through the jobs page to find it, but if you're ever looking, this is kind of where it goes, and this gets stored on the file system in the back end as well. Okay, so moving on here, let's look at another concept. Um, so this is useful, especially when you're authoring. So it's just good to know that this is an option. Uh, so FME Server has uh, some fairly, it's basic, but it's, it's useful um, version control uh, options. So this basically lets you commit new versions of workspaces as you're publishing them to server. So as you're making updates and testing things in the server environment, you can commit these to a version control system. So you can always roll back to a previous version if something goes wrong or you need to restore it. Uh, version controls is a, an administrator task to turn on. So it's found under the system configuration. If you go to version control, uh, that's where you can turn it on and manage it. Um, yeah. So the details of exactly how to configure that and set it up are covered in the server administrator training course. Uh, so if you're interested in kind of learning a bit more about how that works and how to configure it, uh, that's a good place to check. Uh, so for this course, we'll be looking at it from an author's perspective and what you do when version control has been turned on and how that can change your um, authoring experience. So once version control has been turned on, you'll see the different versioning tools uh, enabled in different places when you're interacting with FME server. So one thing you'll see when it's been turned on is when you're publishing to server from Workbench, uh, in addition to the new button beside the repository name, you also see this commit button, which will allow you to commit a new version of the workspace to the version control history. So when you click commit, you can choose to add this version of the workspace to version history and add a little commit message with a note about what changed and why, perhaps. You can also choose to commit a new version of a workspace after you've published it. So I tend to do this myself uh, if I'm not sure about the version of the workspace I'm uploading. So if I want to publish it and then test it to make sure it works before I commit it to my version history, uh, this is what I'll do. So I'll publish it first without committing, do some testing in the web interface, and then I can always go to the repository and commit that version from there. So you'll see this button uh, when you're in the Manage Repositories page in the server interface. So if I go into, so you can access that from Workspaces here. And if you go to Manage Workspaces, this is where you can see all the repositories you've created. And you can click into your repository and select your workspace and commit. So here my version control is not turned on, so I don't have that button, but that's where you'd manage that. So this will be very similar to the process when you're publishing your workspace, you click the commit button. It'll bring up a dialog that lets you add a commit message to put a little bit more information about the new version, and you can commit that to your history. When version control is turned on, you'll also see this history button when you're viewing your repository. And that'll give you a list of all of the different versions that have been committed. It'll tell you who committed it and when. 
And finally here, if you ever need to restore a previous version of a workspace, so for example, you made a change and things went horribly wrong or something, you just needed to go back to an original version, you can go to your version history in, inside the server web interface, locate the version you'd like to restore. Beside each of these versions is a download button, so it'll let you download a copy of the workspace file as it was when it was committed there. And then you'd simply open that in Workbench and then republish that back to FME Server to restore. So here we're getting into an exercise uh, just working through interacting with version control in FME Server. So here you'll actually have to turn it on yourself because they're turned off on these machines, but that's just a simple toggle. Once that's turned on, you can add a version of your workspace to your version history. Yeah, so let's move on to the next thing. So that was version history and version control and server. So it's fairly simplistic, but it is useful to be able just to keep track of your workspaces as you make changes through them. Um, so I'm going to just quickly as a very short aside, um, we had someone ask about being able to play with these exercises a little bit more outside of the class when we're done at 10 o'clock today. Uh, so we are extending the, the machines for an extra hour. So once we're done at 10 o'clock, these machines will be running until 11. So if you wanted to, you could play around and, and do any other work or, or just poke around with FME server if you need to. So that'll be available for an extra hour after the course, after we're done presenting the course for today. So I'll remind you again at the end as well, just in case. So just so you're aware. So next, we're going to look at scheduling. So this is a huge piece of FME Server, um, the ability to schedule jobs to run at a specific point in time and at a specific frequency. What's nice here is um, because you're doing this on the FME Server environment, um, you can have all of your schedules for all of your different workspaces all in a single place. Uh, the other piece that's very useful for this is you can always check the job history for these schedules. So in the server environment, you, know, you can set up you know, 100 jobs to run overnight to do all your data cleanup and processing tasks. In the morning, you can come here and take a look at the, the jobs to make sure everything ran correctly. What's also nice is you can also um, kind of use scheduling with our notification and automation services so that, for example, if a workspace fails when you have it scheduled to run in the middle of the night, uh, it could be configured to send an email to the administrator of that job so that when they come in in the morning, they know something went wrong and they can come in and correct that uh, before bad things happen. So scheduling um, is configured from the schedules page in FME Server. I'll also mention that schedules can be used within automations and we'll look at kind of when you would do that and why moving forward, but we'll look at the basic schedules for now. So when you go to the schedules page, You'll just see a list of all of the existing schedules in your server environment. Um, you'll see a, kind of an example of how frequently they're configured to occur, when they started, and which workspaces they're running, and their current status. So you can choose to disable schedules if you don't want them running. Uh, what is nice in 2020.1, uh, if you are familiar with automations and the scheduling there, you can also choose to show any scheduled automations in this interface as well. So you can see everything in one place. And we'll see what an automation is and, and look at that later on as well. To create a new schedule, it's fairly straightforward. You just go to the schedules page, click on and create new, and then you can configure your schedule. So I'll just demonstrate that briefly here. I just want to talk through a couple of the options. So again, just watch for now. Uh, you'll have an exercise coming up where you get to create one. So I'm just going to build a schedule. So here I can set the name for my schedule in a category just to help me keep them organized. I can add a description if I'd like to provide more context about what the schedule is doing and why. Um, one of the key pieces here is the schedule type. So there are a few different options for how the schedule is configured. So we have the basic type that just lets you tell it to kind of run starting at a specific time or ending at another time and recurring um, like this. So you can have say the 10th day of every month or say yearly on August 10th starting today and all that. So it gives you kind of 
examples of how frequently you want the schedule to run. So daily and weekly are pretty common ones. And that. The other schedule type is repeat on interval. Yeah, you can always adjust the recurrences, absolutely. Um, so here, for example, this one's set up based on today, but if I wanted it to start on Friday, for example, I think the recurrence will be different. So it'll be on the 14th day of every month or the second Friday of the month and that kind of thing, or yearly on August 14th, based on when I started this. Uh, we also have these repeat on interval schedule types. So you can just say repeat every, for example, three days or every three hours or minutes or seconds. Seconds would be a bit much, but you could do that for sure. Uh, so we got a question on when, how to run these on demand. Yep, I can talk about that coming up as well. Uh, the other example here, the other option is cron expressions. So if you're familiar with that, uh, this just provides a much more advanced way to configure a schedule to run. Um, I'd recommend doing a search just on what a cron expression is and how they configure them. But these are quite powerful. So you could set this up to run on every third Tuesday of the month if the month has 30 days or something like that. So if you really wanted to be very specific about your job and you, you're familiar with how these expressions work, um, you can work with that as well. We also have the ability to run something once. So I think this might be kind of a, an on-demand type of schedule. So if you, for example, you wanted to run this job once uh, tonight in the middle of the night, because you know it's going to be a long running job and you'd prefer it not to run during normal work hours, you could just adjust the time here and tell it to start, um, say, Tuesday morning at 1 a.m. Then that job will run once at that time, complete, and that's the end of the schedule. There are also advanced options on these schedule pages, uh, which correspond to the, or they're basically the same ones that you'd see on the run workspace page. So you can say uh, which queue you want this to run in and kind of expiry times for how long it waits in the queue or how long it runs. And you can also tie this into the notification service. So if this job succeeds or if it fails, you can configure this to take a specific action automatically to notify people uh, based on what happens. So if you set this up to occur once and run a month from now, maybe you want to send yourself an email to remind you that this was running so you can have it post to it, you can have it sent to you on success or failure to let you know what happened with that. Awesome. So that brings us to the next exercise here where we're just creating a simple schedule uh, to run the workspace that you published. Yeah, so that was just a fairly straightforward exercise again, just kind of how to create a schedule and to run a job at a specific frequency. So here I'm just going to show a couple little things that I wanted to review on this. So I've just created a schedule similar to what you did. I've set mine up to repeat every 30 seconds. What's useful here when I come to the completed jobs page after the schedule has been running for a little while, I can see all the instances of the schedule. Uh, but one thing I wanted to point out is this um, source name and source type field in the completed jobs page. Uh, so this will tell you what triggered this job to run. So you see at the bottom here, when I ran this job manually, um, it tells me that the user who was logged in when, who ran this was me as the admin, but it doesn't give a source name or a source type, and that's because it was run kind of on demand through the run workspace page. Uh, but you'll see here with the schedule job, it'll tell me the name of the schedule as well that it was a schedule that kicked this off. So this is good to be able to reference kind of what's going on in your server environment. So if you're seeing jobs that are troublesome or anything like that, this is always useful to be able to trace the source of what triggered it to run. The other thing I'll mention is in this page, you have the ability to customize columns. So there are a few additional columns that are hidden by default. Uh, that can be useful. So you can see the, the engine that the job ran on. So if you have multiple engines connected to your FME server and you're having some troubles, you can always turn this on to see which engine it's running on. Um, this is really useful, particularly if you have um, FME server engines installed on different machines all connected to the same core. So it could be that one machine's misconfigured and any jobs being sent to that engine are failing for whatever reason. Uh, this will let you kind of trace that and see which engine jobs are running on. There's also the duration. 
So you can turn that on to see how long jobs are taking. And then the queue. So if you're working with queues in server, you can always see what queue that was submitted to as well. So you can always choose to kind of add or remove displayed columns depending on what you're interested in seeing when you view these. Uh, this column customize column button will be available anywhere you see a table like this. So you can always adjust the columns to customize your view properly. Okay, so let's move on to the next exercise here. So we're coming up toward the end of the day and we have another three exercises. So what I'm thinking is we'll probably finish 1.5 and 1.6 today and we'll pick up tomorrow morning and look at FME server projects before we before I turn it over to Holly to cover chapter two. So we'll do a brief review of projects first thing tomorrow. So let's look at sharing with an FME server. So with FME server security, um, you have access to different components in the server environment based on what the administrator has given, given you access to. For the last few exercises, we've been logging in as the administrator user, so you have full access to everything. But other users won't necessarily be able to see any content that you have created with your own account. So this is where we have the option to share content with other users in FME Server. So if you're the owner of something like a repository here, you'll see a sharing button like this. So you can click on that and that'll open up a dialogue with the sharing options. So you can choose to give different users or different roles within FME Server and have different levels of access to the repository you've created. So you can let them simply run jobs if they want to, you can let them download workspaces from the repository if you'd like them to be able to edit that and make changes. And you can also give them full access to manage the repository. So with that, there's an exercise here, 1.5, to dive into kind of working with sharing and some of the different accounts within the server environment. So with this one, um, we're going to be kind of logging in and out of different accounts to do some testing, so it's a little bit more involved. Yeah, so this is just to show kind of some of the differences between, um, first, what it looks like when you're logging in with different accounts that have different levels of access to FME server. Uh, so one thing you'll notice um, is that, yeah, when you're logged in as that author account, you'll see that that menu bar on the left-hand side is quite different. Um, so that what you see when you log in is all related to what access the server administrator has given you. Um, so if you're ever interested in kind of what security options look like and how to manage that, that's an administrator level task. And you can access that from the user management page. So if you're following me here while I'm in present mode, um, you can see here, if you go to user management, you can see all the, the different user accounts that are available. So you use this to activate your author account. But if you click into any of these, you can see the full list of permissions that this user account has uh, for the FME server environment. So you can see the author has a good amount of permission. Um, something like the guest account would have even less permissions, so this one doesn't have much access to the server interface. You can simply run jobs in that. So this is where you would manage that the access levels. So if you're different users, they'll probably want access to different components in FME server. So you can choose what they do and do not have using this. So that sharing option is great when you're the author and you don't have access to that uh, security kind of management. So you can always come in there and share uh, the different components that you've created. So you got one good question there. Can you create a custom role? So you would have seen the different roles in the user management here. Um, and these allow for kind of giving a set of users a certain set of permissions. So this comes with a set of default roles, uh, but you can create new roles and customize those. So yeah, you have full access to create your own custom roles for specific groups of users as well. Yeah, any other questions on the sharing or anything like that? Uh, one more thing I'll mention on sharing too is that you'll probably notice that you can also share other types of items in FME server. So it's not just specific to repositories. You can share schedules and automations and everything else that you can create in the web interface. If you ever want other users to access something you've built, you can share it with them pretty easily. 
So in the last 10 minutes of today, we're going to cover sharing workspaces. So this is a little bit of a different type of sharing. Um, in this case, uh, what you want to do perhaps is when you've built a workspace, you've created um, some nice workflow with some published parameters that a user can set to request or run a particular data set uh, through a specific workspace. You can use an FME server app to be able to share a link for a user to run the workspace. So normally when you run a workspace, you would do that from the web interface, you'd log in with your account, you'd go to run workspace and select the workspace you'd like to run. What you can do with the workspace app is instead um, basically provide unauthenticated access to run a particular job. So apps are managed from the left hand side, so you'll see server apps, you can build workspace apps and gallery apps. So workspace app is basically a way to share a single workspace that a user can kind of go through the app and run the workspace through there and get access to the output. A gallery app basically allows you to create kind of a web page with a collection of workspace apps or even other URLs to other you know, websites and things like that. So we're going to be looking at workspace apps for now, but you can poke around with the gallery apps if you're interested. Um, these apps are new trying to remember here. I think they came out in 2019. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it was new to 2019, as Holly says, but the gallery apps are brand new for 2020. So you can build a server app directly from this interface. You basically just select the workspace you'd like and create some information about it. So you give it a title and a description. And you can choose which published parameters the users have access to to set. And then Assuming I can scroll down here. Oops, scrolled too much. There we go. Uh, once you've created an app, FME Server will return a URL that you could then share with another user to be able to open kind of a simplified run workspace page. So you can customize this so you don't necessarily need a bright green header there, you can change the color, you can change the icon and the name at the top there to kind of make it more in line with your own style internally in that. Give it a name and a description there and then you can choose to run that workspace after setting the parameter values through the app. So for server apps, you can choose to make them kind of unauthenticated. So if you share the, the link, anyone with access to FME server can go to that link and run the workspace without needing to log in or do anything. You can also create authenticated apps where you share the link with someone who has credentials for FME server. They could then log in before they can access the application. So if you have an app, maybe that's dealing with sensitive data or something you'd like to protect a little bit more, you can add authentication to those apps so people have to log in before they can run the workspace and access the data. The other piece of sharing workspaces is the ability to create a webhook URL. So we saw that briefly when I was showing the run workspace page. So when you have a workspace, you can always choose to create a webhook or create a server app directly from that run workspace page. Uh, what the webhook will do is it basically just provides a way or a link that can be used to run the workspace. So when a webhook is generated, um, It'll create a URL that looks something like this. So it'll point to your FME server instance, the name of the service that the workspace is running under, the repository the workspace is stored in, and then the workspace name. After that, there will be some parameters inside the URL that correspond to the different published parameters in your workspace. So here with your training exercise, you've got your source GML data set and the source KML file and the paths to those are set directly in the URL. So you could then copy this link and if someone was to click on that or put it into a web browser or send a post or a, or a get request to that from another application, the workspace would actually run automatically as soon as this URL was activated and then return the results or a summary of what the workspace did. So this is useful for being able to programmatically run this workspace 